Okay. Oh, there is a raised hand. Yeah, Samarth, please. Uh, hello, ma'am. Am I audible? Yeah. Uh, ma'am, I just wanted to ask, like, uh, yesterday we discussed about the uh, the sand system where we talked about the nuances of the system, how this, how the each uh, like particle size matters and how the texture on it matters. But mm -hmm. at the end, when you showed uh, the the shear and the stress things, the lines that were created, the networks, we at the end discuss, we uh, assumed them to be like circles that are in essence completely smooth. So how valid is that approximation that was sort of made there? Okay, so, so two comments. One is uh, that experimental model system was made out of spherical beads, but the surface is actually reasonably rough. It, even though it doesn't look like it when the circles are drawn, because they're actually physical particles. So there is friction in these systems, solid on solid friction in the force in, in that sheared system. If you didn't have friction, we actually know now that the, those uh, structures don't survive. If the surfaces are really slippery, there's no roughness, uh, you cannot actually create those states. But the, the, but the particles are spheri spherical, like they're cylinders, so the, the surface that we're talking about is as spherical as, as, um, as they can make it experimentally. Uh, I'll show you some results later this week from other kinds of shapes uh, from this same group. But yeah, a lot of the model systems that experimentalists use uh, especially these photoelastic beads, they can, because it, they do 3D printing of this photoelastic, you know, they take photoelastic material and make uh, particles out of it. So they can control the shape pretty much. Does that answer your question? Uh, yeah, thank you. Yeah, but you're right that the mod, but again, I was trying to say, right, when physicists got into this, uh, trying to understand granular systems, they actually spent quite a bit of time thinking about how to create model ideal systems, right, which we can try to understand instead of the sand from Cape Cod that I showed you an electron micrograph of, which is much more complicated. Um, so simple systems do help us. Okay, any other questions? Okay, so I'm going to, uh, this picture on the left is a kind of um, prototypical experiment that physicists first started doing to understand fluctuations in granular materials. So I need to explain this. And um, later on in today's lecture, I'll actually show you uh, a very recent experiment, a paper that came out in PhysRev Letter yesterday which is using the same compaction to explore the idea of a granular thermodynamics, which is basically going to be the subject of the talk today, uh, of this lecture today. So what you're seeing here, these are experiments uh, done in the, the nagel Yeager lab in Chicago in 1997. What you're seeing is, um, again, these are not, sand taken from the beach, right? So these are steel balls uh, or something. I actually have forgotten what they are. I think they're steel balls. So they have actually not very much friction. Uh, <clears throat> so what they're doing is gently tapping the system. So gamma, this x-axis, is the tapping strength. So you keep tapping the system and then after some number of taps that depends on, um, on the st tapping strength, these systems reach a steady state density and then fluctuates about that as you keep tapping. So what is being plotted here is that steady state average density as a function of the tapping strength. And what the main uh, message of this paper was all of these states at different tapping strengths, which ranges from a density of uh, so uh, density of 0.59. Density is normally coated in these systems as packing fraction. So what volume is occupied by the grains? Uh, ranges from 0.9 to about 0.64. 
But all of these uh, states have a solid-like property. They have, in some sense, a shear modulus. They can be sheared and then they don't fall apart. So that was the main focus of this paper, is that you can create granular solids over this whole range of densities by, by changing how um, strongly you tap the system. Another, um, and I will talk about the fluctuations in this experiment, but using this more recent paper from yesterday in a, in a minute. Um, now, the other thing to note is similar to what I was saying about the shared experiments yesterday, that this branch is not reversible, that this bottom branch. So what I mean by that is they first right, create these states by increasing the tapping strength. Then they go back by decreasing the tapping strength now. So start from a dense packing. And, uh, and so at some point after doing this back and forth, you get a reversible branch, which so, uh, so once you get to this, this branch is reversible. So that is, goes sort of the opposite direction, right? That uh, at very low tapping strength, you have a higher density and then it goes to 0.64. So all of these were questions raised at that time. Um, and again, um, we don't understand the details, or we don't understand these processes completely, the, these results completely yet. But my main point here was the way to th the way you think about granular ensembles of granular uh, granular materials is not um, as a thermal ensemble, but as an ensemble that's created by let's say gently tapping or gently vibrating. And going back to, I think Abhishek was asking yesterday. Um, so the, t the taps are like pulses, millisecond pulses. And then you wait for a couple of seconds for the system to, to reach, I'm, I'm, I'm avoiding using the word equilibrate, reach some configuration and then you tap again, and then you tap again. So it's a, very, it's a sort of a quasi-static, slow dynamics process. And uh, all I will discuss in my lectures will have to do with slow dynamics. This is in contrast with you know, things falling down from a hopper or from um, a rapid flows down an incline. Those, I, I, I'm not going to focus on those at all. Uh, but, 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 I mean, uh, yeah. uh, so what's the maximum packing fraction one can get for this? This are, I guess, in 3D, right? Uh, this is all in 3D. Yeah, 3D. So, so, right, so that's... Uh, that's again a debatable point, right? So it's around 0.64 is, okay, the, so... is the for hot spheres, random closed packing is around 0.64. But so, that's okay. only if the configuration is completely isotropic. If you have any anisotropy or any by, by dispersity, right? These were not controlled to be completely monodispersed. Uh, okay. You could get slightly higher. So that packing fraction this notion that there's a unique packing fraction, you know, it's, uh, it, it depends. And that's only for infinitely rigid particles, right? If you don't, can, they cannot be compressed at all. Right, okay. So, so the, but, this, but what you're seeing here in this reversible branch is uh, probably the maximum that it can go to. It cannot go very, without crystallizing, right? So the other possibility is you develop crystallites, right? Because FCC is 0.74 oh, or okay. something like right, that, yeah. right? So if you start ordering, then you can get to much higher uh, densities. Oh, okay. so, so there might be local, uh, local that order. Right now. Yeah, that it's maximally disordered uh, oh, okay. that you get 0.64. And Bulbul, how do you do the backward? Like, in what sense it is reversible? Is it if it is in a packed state, then if I reduce the tapping strength, it will not unpack, uh, right? Or yeah, and uh, you know, three just before coming, I was saying, oh, I should go back to look at the paper to see how they did it, and I've forgotten. So, <laughs> so, so, so I should I should look back at that. Um, I think what happens. 
maybe this is maybe I'm saying this wrong. I think uh, they divide their so as the the reversible branch is as they as they tap, they actually get two classes of systems, one on this branch and one on that branch. So some, some configurations are at higher packing fractions and some, so over this tapping range, you can have like two coexisting dense phases. And Abhishek, now that I'm thinking about it, probably these have some crystallites in them then. Not okay. sure. But then they say, if you take the, this lower branch, then, um, yeah, I I have forgotten what this reversibility what check what the what reversibility check they they did. I should I will I will put the paper on and I will take a look at it also to remind myself. And also, what I find rather non-intuitive is that by tapping, how the graph non-monotonically changes. So the yeah, so it it seems to reach a, a a highest value at some tapping strength and then goes down, right? Yes. Yeah, so I think these are these were not the best controlled experiments at that point. There are many better experiments from um, the Austin group where they have done fluidized, etc. So there is there is a lot of work on this, but there is this notion, and I forget if there's non-monotonicity in all of them. I think there is. Um, I shouldn't have started talking about it without knowing everything about it. But what I wanted to point out is this, that there, there are sometimes these two, two branches that one can get. Um, and at the same tapping strength, there's not necessarily one step. Um, so there's a hysteresis kind of idea in that. Uh, and the other reason I wanted to show it is I'm going to show you the fluctuations. Um, that this new experimental group has now studied in a minute. So I wanted to also show just quickly another. So because I mentioned yesterday that distributions are reproducible, one sort of distribution that people um, have, have verified is robust for granular systems is if you look at the distribution, and I should have labeled my y-axis, the distribution of contact forces. So you have two particles contacting. Uh, if you can measure the force between them and the top graph, so you can measure both the normal force and the tangential force. And if you look at the distribution of that, uh, in a, even in a configuration, so contact by contact, and then you look at many realizations, that distribution has very fat tails. Now, whether it's exponential or power law, those are can be debated, but um, but they do have they are non-Gaussian, and this was the origin uh, one of the original theory papers uh, by uh, Sue Coppersmith, Satya, and people on the Q model was motivated by trying to understand these fat tails. Um, so, and this, this is now true, um, this has now been verified, and the tangential forces usually have this, it doesn't, which sort of makes sense, don't even have like a mean or a peak uh, in it. It sort of just goes from zero to something. So these distributions uh, are, um, are an example of uh, like the numbers might change, but the shapes of the distributions are if you want to characterize them by some universal features, they are quite robust. They don't depend on how uh, granular materials are prepared. I just want to show you a few more, oh, the, uh, let me wait, few more sort of fluctuations that, so what I'm trying to do is motivate this, um, historical um, focus on trying to get an analog of a thermodynamic-like picture for granular materials. So fluctuations like this is what uh, people have been trying to understand. I see there's a chat question in the chat, but I'll come in a minute. OK, so these were um, actually um, analysis done by my group 
uh, from experiments looking at local pressure distribution. So you take a granular packing of the kind that I showed yesterday, those photoelastic materials, and you uh, shear them or do something to them. Um, and because we can measure the local forces, you can me measure the stresses, and, or like all components of the stress in a local volume. So this is looking at the local pressure. So take grains uh, of uh, areas. This is all. This was all two D areas of like you know five by five or ten by ten grains, and then you construct the distribution of the local pressure as you increase the global pressure, right? So you expect do you do expect that you, as you increase the global pressure, the mean of this local pressure distribution should uh, uh, go to the right. But our question was, um, can, we, <clears throat> can we take these distributions and collapse them onto a universal curve uh, for all of these pressures? And as you can see here, and this was with m equal to, okay, so the numbers are actually here, m equal to four. So this is taking larger and larger coarse graining boxes. Um, that one, if I divide this uh, gam, uh, if I multiply the y-axis by the the pressure that I impose, then I and scale this, which is missing here, scale this by the by that overall pressure, then they all fall onto the same curve. So these were all sort of uh, indications that. Um, that some kind of universal distributions of pressures or volumes can be constructed. I Sorry, what was one. small m? What was small m? So, so, so small m is the number of grains in the coarse graining box. Ah, okay, 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 okay. So this was sort of checking extensivity, and I don't want to get into detail here, but I, um, you will, sh you will see that there are pro some problems with extensivity. In these systems, like you know, the, the do things scale as m. Uh, that's still um, for some quantities. Uh, it's it's uh, it doesn't hold. It scales as some non. You know, things are not extensive. Um, so they some some and as we understand now that some properties like torques torque fluctuations cannot grow extensively. Torque fluctuations get localized on boundaries. And maybe in the last lecture, I'll be able to explain why that is true. So those things, of, of course, then don't scale as the volume. They scale as the surface. So if you measure things that are a, a mixture of torque fluctuations and volume fluctuations and pressure fluctuations, then you get all kinds of weird scaling with the, the the size of the system. So I'm pointing out that you know there are features that we still don't completely understand or we don't understand a lot. but uh, but extensivity is something that I, I think I'm still uh, trying to understand in these materials. So what we were showing here is that for four uh, and 27, right? Um, you get slightly different, you, maybe you're following central limit theorem and you're getting to a Gaussian, but it wasn't clear, right? So that's the, that was the purpose of doing two coarse graining sizes. Like the M equal to four certainly has a more non-Gaussian tail than this one, but does it go away? It's not clear to me, right? So here it's a log plot. So this is certainly more Gaussian than that. So well, one thing we can say is they, they do collapse, but I, I don't know how they scale with them. Uh, so I, I missed it. Uh, can you uh, repeat what is M? M is the, so, so these are the stresses um, that you measure in a given area within this experimental system. And M, is the number of grains enclosed in that. So M is just four grains. Okay, okay. Okay, and 27 is like a, uh, uh, yeah, uh, 27 grains. So this is another thing that we found, mm, just, um, and again, now I've begun to understand more of this, 
whether you keep the same volume or the same number of grains, the way things scale with the size uh, is, is different. So volume scaling and number of grain scaling seems to be different. Hang on, I do see. Um, the the Chaikin and Torquato and uh, packing fraction for ellipsoids wasn't a tapping experiment. That was addressing a different question. If you ask me at the end of the lecture, I can uh, uh, I can uh, try to address that. That wasn't uh, about um, the uh, uh, that wasn't about this. Um, what basis for m equal to those are just the two i plotted here so you know we did all of the way starting from m equal to four to i think we did m equal to maybe 27 was the largest because i all we also the, the systems that i should mention that the systems that are studied in these photoelastic experiments are not very big they're only about a thousand grains they can't do very many more than that so they're small systems, which is another issue, right? Is when do you reach the thermodynamic limit, et cetera. Okay, I want to show you one more. Uh, so this is an interesting, um, and again, there have been more recent experiments on this, but this is, I'm pointing this experiment out because I think it got me on the path of uh, using stress as a definition of an ensemble um, or the analog of energy to define an ensemble. So what I'm showing you here are again, experiments from the uh, lab of Bob Berenger using photoelastic grains. And this is um, a quet cell. So, um, you're shearing it, and there is an inner cylinder and an outer cylinder. These are all two-dimensional systems. That's all, the only way you can do photoelastic experiments. And the the outer the, uh, the the inner cylinder is stationary, and then you're rotating this cylinder. And what you see again is this is now colored regions of high stresses, regions of low stresses. But what I'm uh, we focused on is if you look, measure the stress in a box of about this size, I think this is pretty much to scale. As a function of time, this is now actually you're slowly shearing. You're not tapping and stopping, tapping and stopping. You're actually doing shearing at a slow rate. You see these sort of avalanche behaviors, right? The stress drops. Um, so so, so the, the, this part of the system as a whole, the stress, the shear stress goes up, drops, goes up, drops, goes up, drops. So we looked at the fluctuations of those, and again, so the distribution of the stress drops, and this distribution of the stress drops, again, we could understand, and this is sort of all ad hoc theory at this point. This was years ago. Um, we could fit to a, dis or we could fit to a distribution and that distribution we can characterize in terms of only a few parameters that dependent or that depended on the shear rate and the packing fraction. So here I've showed you two different shear rates and two different packing fractions. So these slides that I'm showing you now uh, is just to say, okay, there are certain statistical properties of these systems that seem to be um, telling us that there should be an underlying statistical mechanics. And roughly the thinking has always been that there is some conserved quantity. Conserved in some way, and we, uh, uh, we will delve into that more, uh, not like energy, but something. For example, if the stress drops here, and you actually have an elastic material, right? If the material is actually elastic and something happens, a contact breaks or a multiple contacts break and the stress drops, then somewhere else the stress will go up because of the elastic Green's function. So there is a long range transmission 
of this. So somewhere else, this will trigger another avalanche. So this is a kind of picture that uh, uh, people have un used to understand plasticity in elastic materials. And the concept that came out of that is maybe then one can come up with the notion of an intensive quantity, something like a temperature, by thinking of this being a subsystem of this that. Right? So that's very roughly speaking the kind of uh, frameworks that people have been focusing upon for many decades. And I will, today's lecture, I will give you that historical perspective. And then I want to move away from that a little bit. Uh, this focus on an intensive quantity and a bath and a subsystem. And I'll try to justify why moving away from that is, uh, is uh, I think, uh, at this point, uh, is what we should be doing. But the idea was here, even our work at this point where we did this, constructed this distribution was based on this notion that maybe there's a temperature-like quantity, which is coming from this sort of mechanical noise. It's not thermal noise, it's mechanical noise, because if something breaks and I am trying to satisfy force and torque balance everywhere, some other part of the system has to take up that slack. So that's the kind of thinking that, um, that I will discuss today and see how far we have gotten. Uh, Bulbul, the, this delta gamma in this plot is the, are the jumps or? Uh, just these jumps, just, just these the jumps. jumps. Okay. Yeah, so this okay. is the distribution of the jumps. And as you can see, it's a power law cut off by an exponential. And then what we, what we well is that what it is yes yeah it's a log log plot it's a power law cut off by an exponential and we could fit it to saying this exponential cut off and the so these two distributions um i forget ex the 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 point of this exercise was to show that you can actually think of these fluctuate describe these stress drops in terms of a distribution where if you imagined rather than a thermally activated process there was a mechanically activated process so the system was sitting in some instead of sitting in some energy minimum and then temperature kicking it out of it like a kramer's escape process if you said oh we actually have something that's sitting locally in some fixed pressure or fixed shear stress, and then something fails somewhere else, and that creates, a, uh, that activates a process in here and kicks it out of that stress to, you know, where, where it just collapses completely. So that's that was the notion. But I'm not arguing that these are the right theories or anything like that at this point. I'm just saying that there are notions from other parts of statistical mechanics that seem to be giving us some clues as to what these fluctuations might be doing. So, Bilbul, this fluctuations are they local or they are correlated over long distances? I don't know. These were I, I'm not, so. Well, let me put it this way: in these experiments, uh, when we did the analysis, we didn't measure them. But now we know from other experiments that they're correlated. They're strongly correlated. Uh, okay. Right, so, so because um, in these experiments, they measured only this one small, the stresses in this only one small area. So you could look at the fluctuations as a function of time in this small window, but you didn't know what was going on elsewhere. Okay. But we know now from other experiments that these um, these are highly correlated. And this this is the kind of, you know, when Shanzi, we worked on this random down that random field Ising kind of model. Um, I, I think those kinds of models have to be extended to try and understand these. Okay. Uh, okay, let me skip this. This was suspensions. Let me skip this. Um, 
I'm going to come back to that later in some other lecture. So um, before I'll, uh, I'll look at the questions in the chat, but this quote, I want to put up this quotation from that paper, the, the earliest of the, that 97 paper uh, on looking at compaction, right? S talking about how to think about fluctuations in granular systems. And I'm, you don't need to read the whole thing at this point, but basically saying that, that there's this sort of notion that gr uh, grains live in metastable states, uh, granular systems, uh, live in metastable states, and there are lots and lots of metastable states, like glassy systems, um, and they don't go, or they don't sample these metastable states through thermal fluctuations, but through some kind of external driving, like tapping or vibrations. And can we try to understand those fluctuations through some kind of equilibrium-like framework? That was the, that was the notion. So I'm going to show you one slide, one more slide to sort of uh, introduce that notion schematically, pictorially. And then I want to, and then I want to look, uh, uh, show you some results from this FISDREB letter from yesterday. Okay, so the idea of this equilibration so what I want to point out is the, the notion, what people have been trying to do, and, mo and starting from a proposal by Sam Edwards many, many years ago, is not to come up with sort of a dynamical theory, but coming up more with sort of an analog of an equilibrium uh, stat Mackey theory. And these pictures here sort of illustrate, they're taken from our lecture notes by Olivier Dosho. Um, illustrates sort of how, how people have been thinking about it. So the contrast is um, being uh, shown here is on the, the left side of the system, I have a thermal system. And so, you know, whether I have what, and this is a bath and this is a subsystem of it, and we rely on, um, or we, the fundamental assumption in equilibrium statistical mechanics is that these two parts, the system and the bath, can equilibrate. And the point that Olivier was trying to make here is they can equilibrate because the energy scale of the, the scale at which energy is being exchanged is the same inside the subsystem and outside in the bath because we are looking at atomic systems or molecular systems. But if I now say, oh, the, I am looking at the air outside in my room, outside this uh, experiment that I'm doing with my granular system, then that equilibration cannot happen because these are huge particles. So the kind of, you know, if I think about kinetic theory collisions, the kind of energy transfer that happens will go primarily into exciting, let's say, phonons inside my particles. That's the energy scale. It's not going to go into moving my particles, right? So you sort of, the energy goes in from the outside bath into the subsystem, but in the subsystem, I have this much bigger particles. So most of these energies, we say, gets dissipated. In what sense are they dissipated? They go into heating up these particles, right? Creating phonons inside. Those are not the degrees of freedom that we are interested in. So those degrees of freedom might equilibrate with the outside, but the configuration of these grains, that's not equilibrating with the outside because energy is being dissipated, right? So it's sort of this, this huge separation of energy scales, but, then one can say, oh, how about I just think of this system. Now I've translated to the right. This is my full system. So I'm looking at my granular system. And now I focus on parts of it inside the granular system, the subsystem of a bath of granular system. So now my energy scales are the same. And now let's say I'm tapping it or vibrating it. And then I ask, is there a notion 
of equilibration of this small subsystem with the outside? And is there a kind of an intensive quantity that, um, that can describe that equilibration, right? So, so just, a remind, just a quick reminder, right? In a thermal system, if I have this, the subsystem and the bath, then if I let them equilibrate, they'll reach the same temperature. Correct? Because energy fluctuations, so energy fluctuates, but entropy maximization leads to a state where the temperature of the inside and the outside are the same. So the question, the notion was maybe for gently tapped systems, this kind of equilibration uh, where it's described by uh, an intensive parameter actually does exist for granular systems. So for the rest of today's lecture, I'm going to focus on this notion and see how far it has been tested, what are the problems with it, um, etc. So let me just look at the chat and then I am going to transition to writing on my iPad and then come back to uh, what is gamma gamma n in the distributions I was showing you no that was the total pressure for the n particle system okay I should have uh, so Fabian you asked a question about a Fourier transform can you ask it again which peaks I think in the plot where you had those jumps and you plotted the distribution oh, of the jumps. Oh, 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 in the power spectrum, yes, of course. The avalanches, yeah, yeah. So, so you, yes, you can look at the power spectrum of those, or you can look at the, yeah, yeah. They all they, they show sort of avalanche behavior, right? Uh, and people, so two slides ago, okay, yeah, that must be. This one, I'm assuming, right? Yeah, you can look at the uh, the power spectrum instead of looking at it as a function of time, and it will show sort of it shows classic avalanche behavior. The I I I don't want to get into this, but there are some subtleties about the how these avalanches happen and how they depend on the on the strain rate is what we were uh, trying to understand. So, 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 so the basic question we were trying to uh, uh, answer in this, this, this experiment, which is taking me away from looking at this ensemble idea, is the stress in the granular systems flowing granular systems increases very slowly with the shear rate. Normally, like in a normal Newtonian fluid, stress is proportional to shear rates. Stress is viscosity times gamma dot. In lots of other kinds of complicated systems, it might go with some power that's lower than one. So there's, there's an yield stress and then the stress goes up with gamma dot to some power. In these systems, they go up logarithmically. So, so the question was, can we try to understand that? And that's where this whole idea of maybe there is some kind of activated process that uh, naturally leads to this very slow glassy dynamics came from. So the avalanches are were part of the story. And I'm uh, if. If we want to delve into this later this week, I can I can talk more about it. But um, the reason I'm not talking so much about these earlier works of ours is they were all ad hoc in my mind. Uh, I didn't have a very good understanding of what leads to this. And I think we are at the beginning of a theory for all of these, but we haven't pushed that theory to understand complicated um, 
systems like this where avalanches are happening and I have a quet cell and this kind of sharing. But I, I, I want to sort of, I, from my perspective, I've sort of moved away from these ad hoc theories a little bit and that's why I'm not focusing on them so much. Okay, one more chat and then I'm, okay. Okay, so with that sort of may, maybe sort of messy introduction into why we are trying to think about a statistical mechanics and the granular uh, thermodynamics, let me... Ma'am, uh, in the last figure, uh, in the last uh, slide. The, like going... Yeah, one more. Uh, uh, this one? Yes, this one. Uh, what uh -huh. exactly is happening here? Uh, these granular particles don't have any momenta associated to them, in a, right? No, 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 no. So here, imagine, imagine this is... Um, uh, I'm actually shaking it or doing something uh, to it. Okay, okay. So there is a continuous injection of energy. Okay. Yes, there's a continuous injection of energy, right? So I'm injecting energy, and then then the idea is uh, if I'm injecting energy to the outside atoms and molecules, are they able to? Uh, well, the not they of course transmit that energy inside. But are the granular particles inside able to um, transform that energy into motion of the granular grains themselves, right? And, and the point is that very little of that energy probably goes into moving them around. Most of it goes into exciting internal uh, microscopic, you know, phonon modes inside these particles. So why would they ever come to equilibrium with the outside air? So that's why thinking, even though nominally this granular system is at the same temperature as the outside bath, uh, looking at the relevant degrees of freedom, the, the particle, the motion of the grains themselves, they are not at that temperature. Does that answer the question? Uh, yes, like, but uh, like specifically for granular bath, in the sense uh, here the particles, uh, these uh, let's say beads, these beads are gonna collide with each other, and uh, like, is that going to happen or? It yeah, yeah. So on the uh, yes, absolutely. So then we are saying, okay, let me take this inside granular system and think of that as my system, right? And ask, do different parts of this granular system equilibrate in some way. Okay, fine, fine, yeah. They don't equilibrate and come to the same temperature as the outside air, but do they equilibrate and reach a common value of some intensive quantity? It's not going to be temperature, but is there something else? Um, Bulbul? Yeah. Yeah, so you are also, I mean, driving it homogeneously or only from the boundary? No, here it's being driven homogeneously. Because if you drive only from the boundaries, then it doesn't propagate to inside, right? Right. right. Yeah. No, this is being driven homogeneously. Like imagine this is on a shaker and you're doing this. And I guess even then it depends on what kind of noise uh, you are putting that determines the velocity distributions, I guess, right? At least yeah, that's what... Yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah, that's what some of the calculations actually we did. Uh, I mean, it's says i mean it's not something universal uh, like the equilibrium case where you always get a gaussian distribution for the velocity the velocity distributions are hardly ever gaussian yeah yeah right so yeah. yeah so what i'm trying to say is that um if you get away from momenta and energy and try to identify other quantities mm -hmm then there seems to be a notion of uh, some kind of equilibration and intensive quantities and extensive quantities. Again, I would say take, we have to still take it with a grain of salt, but there seems to be evidence that, 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 that some quantities like that can be identified. And the way I rationalize it is by looking at other stat max systems that I know about. So uh, 
so but we cannot think of momenta and energy uh, and those uh, and the conjugate variables to those momenta yes in some sense because momenta momentum is still conserved um but yeah so so i absolutely agree sanjeev this this um the the point of this uh this discussion even in olivia dosho's lecture notes was not to say that there is a temperature or there's a maxwell boltzmann distribution but there that maybe under certain circumstances one can define an intensive quantity for these systems an intensive quantity uh, that uh, two parts of a granular system have in common when they are being driven slowly or are jammed, but they're not they are not our usual intensive quantities. Okay. okay, so that was the that was the whole point. Okay, okay, I'm going to get out of this um, and I'm going to introduce the first of so I'm going to share my stop sharing here I'm going to start with what is known as the Edwards volume ensemble and then I'll show you and maybe that's where uh, and then I'll show you these very recent experiments that um, came out in a PRL yesterday which Okay, so I'm actually going to write now, right? So, so I'm going to start, this is historical. So there's a proposal by Sam Edwards in the late 80s that, and he was thinking really of hard sphere packings, that just like as in equilibrium, thermodynamics, and he's thinking about thermodynamics, energy is conserved in granular systems. Volume is conserved. And he even went to this idea that just like I have a Hamiltonian here, which, uh, which uh, prescribes the dynamics, There's a volume function here, a volume function that's a function of the positions of the grains, which describes the dynamics. That was his proposal. But the proposal was based on two other. Uh, so this proposal applied when he described it to slowly driven systems. And, and I'm saying this because people often take it uh, and apply it to systems that Edwards never meant them to be applied to. Slowly driven systems, hard spheres or hard particles, so infinite, infinitely rigid. And this, his, his mapping, so, okay, so this, so these were two st strict conditions and what he thought, what the other mapping with equilibrium in uh, equilibrium in normal systems he mapped to the ensemble of what he called blocked states So in modern parlance, I would say block states are jam states. The way he described them was that these are states where the grains have no place to move. So if I have a hard sphere packing, right? Because I have a, uh, I have a constraint that hard spheres cannot overlap. If I get the particles to be dense enough, so that I'm at the random closed packing kind of limit, then I can create configurations where the 
the grains have, there's no way I can move a grain without creating an overlap, right? So he called these block states. Now, of course, as you, I can have many, many, many of these states at a given packing fraction, which here is close to random closed packing or exactly random closed packing. And his picture was if I tap and look at the end state. So I look at the end states of my dynamics where nothing is moving, then that ensemble can be described by a volume function in the sense that I can think of an entropy as a function of volume just like I think of entropy as a function of energy in normal thermal systems. And then I can come up with the notion of an intensive quantity that's the derivative of that entropy with respect to volume. And if I tap a system slowly, then that intensive quantity plays this like the role of a temperature. That was his proposal, right? So what so there, there are multiple, so starting from that, what are the consequences? So then he also assumed equiprobability, right? So this is, this is the fundamental um, postulate of equilibrium stat mech, right? And at this point, if people have questions, they should just speak up because I'm not looking at, uh, right? The fundamental pro, pro postulate of equilibrium statistical mechanics, which is the basis of microcanonical, is that all states with the same energy are equally likely. So, Bulbul, I had one. Yeah. When you talk about the volume of the configured space, is it the number of the uh, jam state or the basin of attractions around? Oh, no, no. This, this volume? Yes. This is actually the volume occupied by the grains. Okay. It's the volume occupied by the grains. Right. And as you can see already, that's a very ill defined concept. Hmm. So, so even though all of this works in some way, uh, I have huge problems with it. Um, so, so the way it's often defined is by drawing the Voronoi volume around the grain and then saying, you know, what fraction of that is occupied. Um, but depending on how you define volume, people might get different uh, results. But I have one more uh, one more concern, but we can come to that. But that was it. It's the volume occupied by the grains. So one thing then I did miss you at some point said about the number of jammed states that also played some role. Right. So so I'm coming to that. Right. So so to establish an ensemble, then right. So he's saying take volume to be energy. Then he said, okay, how do I compute? Um, the probability distribution of a, a microstate. So for him, a microstate. Uh, sorry, ma'am. Uh... Yeah, give me one second. It's just the positions of the grains, right? So these are blocked states. So my, and then he's asking, what can I say about what's the probability of finding a particular configuration? And is it going to like, so the question is, is it going to look like some e to the minus volume of that configuration divided by something which looks like temperature. Mm. That was the proposal. Uh, that was the that was what he actually proposed that this has to be true. Okay. Okay, I had there was a question. Uh, yeah, about the volume only. I mean the volume of hard spheres, it's not gonna change. If the number is fixed, the volume is not gonna change. 
So what exactly? If you put the same number of particles inside the same box, it's not, it's, uh, well, that's the question, right? So you saw in that compaction experiment that the volume actually changed. Because uh -oh. it does depend on how the particles are arranged. It's not N over V. N over V nominally is, all right? So, but I can, or my grains can fill up. So the, how much void space I have depends on how the particles are arranged. Oh, so it's like a, you draw a boundary around all the particles and the volume enclosed inside. Ah, okay. No, no. Then within that box, you're asking how much of that space let's say is occupied by grains and how much by voids that would be just v minus the volume of hard spheres right yeah you have to do sure yes so you have to do a more local uh definition of that uh so yeah if you take that whole volume that's uh you're right if i just define it that way and that's why i was saying you have to take the voronoi around each uh, Voronoi is basically you connect all the centers and then calculate the... Uh... Right. So that depends on uh, how the grains are organized, correct? Okay. Yes. Right. So the Voronoi volume, so average Voronoi volume of a grain, okay. let's say is what this is. Okay. Okay. Times N. Yeah. Since yeah. Since it's an extensive quantity. Okay. Right, people have come up with other ways of measuring some local volume, but it has to be something that is sensitive to the local structure, not just this uh, the, the the volume minus the hard sphere volume, the number of grains times the volume of a grain. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. But. You're asking very good questions. I always have problems with this volume, but I'll show you the experiments also, how they do it. Uh, 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 yeah. uh, sort of related question. I mean, so, I mean, can, so supposing I have a box and then I put, uh, so let's say hard disks uh, with, uh, so RIs are the, let's say the center of mass of the hard disks, right? And right. Uh, so within the given volume, of course, I can uh, rearrange the bo uh, balls in a large number of ways. So of course that would usually give also me just the configurational entropy of the system, right? So yeah. is that kind of different from this object or it's the same? Not very different. It, we are talking only about the configuration entropy. Configurational entropy, okay. I think the, the yeah, the, the, the crucial thing that Edwards proposed is the existence of this intensive quantity, right? Which he called uh, com compactivity. Mm. Right, and the idea was that if you took a big box, right, so this is big versus, so this is my bath, which has some fixed volume, right, and then I take a small part of it, and I look at the distribution of these Voronoi volumes inside here, so this is my subsystem. And what he argued is that if I now do this, then I'll find an intensive quantity, which is this uh, compactivity. So if I keep, if I do this and I shake and, uh, or I tap, and then I look at the end state, and then I look at the distribution, I look at many, so I have lots of, I've done this lots of times, I have many, many, boxes like this, or I look inside one system and I look at different parts of it, then all of them have the same X. And so the probability of finding a, a, a volume, the probability of finding a volume inside my subsystem, so let me call this the subsystem or system, right? The rest is the bath is going to be some omega v of s e to the minus v s over x over some partition function. That was his proposal. Where x, just like normal thermodynamics, right, 
or x in x inverse. So he's equating x with kt. And he's saying x inverse, which is like beta, will be del log omega v del v. That was his proposal. Right, so what, what he's saying is that the volume distribution has a Boltzmann-like character. So following this, wouldn't the close, most uh, close back structure would be the most probable? So that's where the entropy will peak. So that will have the, so where, where, so right, just, so that's sort of like, like a spin system, right? Where I can have negative temperatures kind of things or the temperature goes to infinity at some point. So the degeneracy uh, factor plays the role there. That's right. That's right. So, so that was his. That was the original Edwards proposal. Um, that there is such an intensive quantity, and volume distributions should look Boltzmann-like. And it has been tested extensively. And since this is, um, but what would it imply then is a question before I, so I'll show you the test that came out in this uh, recent physical review letters. Um, what it implies then though, right, is that there some some notions of equilibrium thermodynamics are valid, like why am I reaching some common X, right? So, so, so defining an entropy is not a problem, right? I can define a configurational entropy that depends on volume. To get this, I have to say that the configurations that I'm seeing um, are maximizing entropy subject to the same kinds of, um, are maximizing entropy and volume can fluctuate between these two systems with the constraint that the total volume is fixed, right? Just like energy, right? To get to, so reminder to students about how we normally get this in a thermodynamic system, right? Is there's an internal system. I fix this at total energy E. So this is my E total. And I ask, what's the probability of finding the subsystem with some energy uh, ES? And we use the microcanonical ansatz. The, the couple of things I want to point out that are crucial, right? So what do we say? That um, this total energy, so this is the bath, and this is the total energy. So the total energy is bath. plus system, and I just want to point out the assumptions that we make. We are saying then the boundaries don't matter, or the interfaces don't matter, right? So that this interfacial energy coming from this boundary is sub is subintensive, so it doesn't matter, right? So all of these are perfectly good assumptions for energy, but for other quantities, we need to think through if these are valid or not, right? And the other point is then you, have, you say that if I have a density of states for this material, which is omega of E, right? Who's a, so entropy is negative log of omega of E. Then we assume that omega of E total is omega of E bath times omega, omega of E s, right? Again, we are ignoring the boundaries. So this is again this product assumption. And also, this assumption is my equiprobability assumption, right? So S being log of omega E, uh, so sorry, and omega of E 
is nothing but the sum of all my microstates which have an energy in you. Right? So there's an equiprobability assumption. Now the equiprobability assumption relies on our godicity. So, right, so why would a granular system obey equiprobability? Right? So which is also a problematic notion. So what I'm trying to point out is what could be the problems with establishing this granular thermodynamics. Does that make sense? So just to compare with the Edwards formula for the probability, if the system was a thermal hard disk system, so where the temperature doesn't play any role because of hard core interactions, then the only difference would be that the exponential term would not be there. Is that correct? So, uh, uh, so you're saying a thermal hard sphere system? Yeah, but because it's hard sphere, it, it temperature don't play a role because there's no energy scale. You can scale it out, right? Yeah. So yeah, the energy is either zero or infinite. But right. I still don't. Uh, so I can I can still think of this volume and asking what's the configurational entropy. And that's the way we get everything, right? So what but there's the no notion of this compactivity. Exactly. So in that st equi standard equilibrium formula, I will only not have the exponential part. Exactly. So I just I, I have just this density of states, right? Okay. Yes. And what exactly. he's saying, though, is that if I take, there is this notion of a compactivity, an intensive quantity. So so that's the, that's the crux of... Uh, of the or that's the that's the notion that's really problematic or might be problematic right does there is does it uh so one thing though right is hard sphere systems thermal i know they're ergodic so they will sample all of phase space yes here there is no such notion um because it's a thermal so whether they you know how they sample the space is completely um, unknown. So if this works, it's actually quite remarkable, right? That it does. So this sort of zeroth law of thermodynamics that I reach the same intensive quantity and there is such an intensive quantity is quite remarkable. Um, it does seem to work. So maybe since I am uh, have only 20 minutes, let me, uh, let me actually share this paper with you. Sorry, I'm going back and forth between. And if I have confused the students, please. Uh, I... OK, so here is a uh, this is the archive version, but this paper just came out in physical review letters yesterday. And it's in um, I, there's, it's in physics news, all of it. So experimental tests on the Edwards volume ensemble, which is what I was just showing you, uh, for tapped granular packing. So the same kind of tapping that I showed in this BAT 97 paper. So different tapping strengths, creating different um, mean volumes. But then what they do is they take small, small subsystems, and small as has, seems to be like it has to be pretty large. But what I'm, I'll show you the figures and let's go through those. And I'll pause it. Okay. So let's go through the figures and I can't see. Oh, I'm, am I sharing screen? No. Okay. okay. So now I'm sharing screen. Okay, so that first plot on the left is showing the packing fraction or the density as a function of this tapping strength, similar to that kind of um, Chicago experiment. Three different kinds of particles with different friction coefficients. So that's, let's just say this is the most frictional. This is slightly less frictional, slightly less frictional. Then what they do is measure 
the distribution of these local Voronoi volumes Of course, as a, so this is this is the the histogram of those volumes as a function of volume, and you see some kind of a distribution which is this gamma k distribution, Gaussian with some tails here. So k times e to the minus um, v times something, and at the same time they also look at the variance of this distribution. So just the variance again normalized. Um, by m as a function of the packing fraction. What they're trying to establish is the existence of this compactivity. So how are they going to do that? Uh, it's this method that many of us have used of overlapping histograms. So this is what the, so if the Edwards proposal is correct, right then the probability if i take two states let's me say one is a reference state and the other is some other state then the ratio of those two probability distributions should depend on v and the difference in these inverse temperatures so what you are test right so one thing that i want to point out is we not, often don't think about this this Boltzmann distribution is very special. The probability of finding an energy is something that depends only on energy, omega of E, times, and the only way it depends on the combination of energy and temperature is an exponential. We don't think of it because it comes naturally, but that, if that form is, uh, is there, then it does, um, show the existence of an intensive quantity. What you don't know is what is zero temperature or what is infinite temperature, right? There is no notion of what that is, but going back to what Tridib was saying, and that's what they do here, they take um, the random, the random loose packing to have infinite compactivity, so zero temperature. Right, so this is the loosest packing that you can have that has zero temperature. So if you assume that, then you can try and work out if there is a temperature, the notion of a compactivity and what that looks like. So they do, the, this experiment is quite impressive in what it, it, what it uh, establishes. Uh, and the way they measure the volume is by this Voronoi construction. Uh, I should also tell you how they did the exp uh, experiments. These are 3D. They did X-ray tomography, and they measured the Voronoi volumes of the grains. Okay. So, um, so th th this is just taking these distributions, and now I can extract. this inverse compactivity by, by taking that, um, by fitting it to that form of, uh, of P of um, E to the minus V over X times some omega E, but I take two configurations and I take a ratio of those two so that the partition functions cancel out. The partition functions and the omegas cancel out, but they ultimately also get the omegas out. So this is a temperature as a function or inverse temperature as a function of packing fraction, inverse temperature as a function of tapping strength. And what they're saying is there is such a notion of an inverse temperature or inverse what Edwards called compactivity. And that there is an equation of state then, right? So just like I can have temperature as a function of density, they're saying there's some kind of an equation of state, uh, either as a function of the tapping strength or as a function of the packing fraction, but different particles have different equations of state, which is completely normal. Then they go ahead and, and some of this I haven't completely understood yet. I have to go back and look at exactly how they did it. But 
um, they actually extracted the density of states for these three different types of particles. And it does seem to have, you know, the right kind of structure, as you were saying, right? So there is a maximum of this dense uh, omega, which is where the maximum entropy is. Where that is depends on the friction coefficient of the particles. It's, it's only for the very low friction uh, and I actually don't know how this is normalized, why it's uh, 1.7. It's normalized in some way, but, but it has the kind of structure that I expect in a, in a spin system where I go between plus minus and look at omega. Of, uh, I, this is, it has a peak, it doesn't keep going up. But omega is not exponentially distributed, or is it? Like, so in it, like equilibrium system, you would find that the omega is very peaked like an equilibrium with uh, sharp, but that's not. No, omega of E, right, is the, So if, if I have an ideal gas, right, with no energy, up, upper limit of energy, then omega would just increase exponentially with energy. Yes, and it would go as exponential of the... Correct, uh, in, uh, of the system correct. size. And yeah, it will get exactly. really, really sharp, right? Yes. So yeah, I'm not seeing that here. Okay. I'm not seeing that here. It looks to me more like a uh, omega of M in a magnetic system, right? where yeah. I do have, first of all, uh, a bound uh, or, or, or even as a function of energy because uh, my energy uh, has a bound, right? Mm. Um, spin systems, because the energy cannot, uh, energy, or my, what am I thinking about? The whole negative temperature concept, um, because my energy is bounded, it cannot... Um, So all spin up or all spin down, right? That's the best I can do. It will scale with energy, but it's uh, with scale with system size, but there is an upper limit if I divide E by over N, right? So this seems more like that to me, which I don't understand because volume is a continuous variable. I don't see why, but maybe there there is something here. Um, as then, sorry, extensive parameter, is it the number of total uh, grains or? So what is my extensive parameter? It should be the, the system size, the number of grains. Okay. okay. Right? Uh, but here, right, it's M. So they're taking subsystems of size M. Hmm. So that's and the again, there was somewhere here, there's no, the, okay, the, that's going to come. Extensivity with M is problematic. So this they're doing, um, for 1m, they have chosen one particular coarse graining volume. Okay. And you'll see that that's problematic. So some of these things are still, so the notion, right, to, for me to define an intensive quantity, I need to have my volume scale extensively. Otherwise, or my entropy, as you're saying, omega scale, exponentially so that I can define an intensive quantity that doesn't depend on M. And I think that is problematic here, even though they're shoving it under the rug. Um, okay. Okay, um, I'll come to this, uh, this curve in a second because I want to end the lecture by giving you that notion uh, if I have five minutes. But here is, um, where I think there's a problem with extent. So first of all, at uh, if I don't dig very deeply, it does look like they have established this volume ensemble for Edwards. And they're not the first ones to do it, but they have done the most careful analysis that I can find and done it in three dimensions, which people hadn't done before. Okay, here is where the problem I find with extensivity is. This is the variance of the distribution. So the variance of the distribution should not, scaled by M, should not depend on M. Hello. <laughs> so, 
So, so the variance does depend on the packing fraction, which it should, but then these are for different M's and you see that it keeps changing with them. So there is no, and by M equal to 30, which means a volume of air 30 cubed, they're at the size of their system. So the fact that this variance does not, uh, doesn't seem to, um, to approach a saturation limit makes me doubtful of um, the extent. So what they have, when they have uh, taken, when have, they have extracted this intensive parameter is by taking M equal to 15. Right? They haven't tried to see how things would change as they keep increasing M, even for small M to large M, which, and this is, uh, I will not be able to talk about this today, that scaling with M becomes much, much more robust if you choose a different extensive quantity and adopt the Edwards idea which I will do uh, in my third lecture. I was hoping I would get started on it today, but, uh, but I will not. Um, so let me introduce that notion. And the reason I think volume is a, the reason I think that the extensivity doesn't work with volume is I have no notion of a local volume conservation. And I think whoever was asking me about this, about hard spheres, that's the, of course, volume is conserved globally, right? If I put N uh, hard spheres in a volume and they are not overlapping, there is some uh, globe. But does it say that at what scale my volume is conserved or volume is cannot, uh, if, uh, at what scale can I say that, oh, if I have some volume that I'm putting in, the same volume I have to take out into the bath? Does it happen at every grain? I don't think so, right? It depends on what kind of size. There's no local conservation law, which I will argue uh, tomorrow that there is such a local conservation law for the stress or the extensive version of this uh, version of the stress, and then the stress is a much more robust quantity to think about uh, if we want to try to think about its uh, intensive quantities. So maybe I should just I have four four minutes. Maybe um, I should just stop and then. Um, yeah, but I, I, I had a question. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, so I'm just trying to understand exactly this. Uh, I mean, these fluctuations in V. So the quantity they are looking at is uh, like uh, I take some m number of let's say four uh, hard spheres, which are probably near. No, no, neighbors. these are actual experimental systems, right? Right. Yeah. So I thought that it was hard so spheres. Reasonably right? hard. Right, yeah. Not infinitely so I, rigid, yeah, but yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. so I look at four spheres which are kind of close by and look at the volume occupied by them and then look at the fluctuations. No, they look at the Voronoi volume yeah. um, and look at the distribution of the Voronoi volumes. Of four, uh, let's say, nearest yeah, neighbor. So let's say I have four, then I have four Voronoi volumes, right? Yeah. And then and I'm look at the volume partition of my system into four, 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 four. And I ask what's uh, the distribution okay. of the Voronoi of volumes. volumes as I go to different parts of this system. Okay. And then if I, um, if I, so it's, so it's the average Voronoi volume of those four particles. Right, yeah, okay. Now, if I take a 10, 10 grains, I'll take the average Voronoi volume of those 10 but I'll take different parts of my sample uh, of, with 10 grains and I will construct a histogram. Does that make sense? Right. right. Okay. So let's take this part. What's the average Voronoi volume here? What's the average Voronoi volume there? And I construct just a histogram of that. Okay. And you also do, like, you keep tapping the system and, like, uh, taking statistics over a large number of configurations? 
it's it's not clear to me from here. Oh, I was okay, looking okay. at that because they say they do reach a steady state and they keep tapping, right? But then uh, I am assuming that because they say they have lots of configurations, but they don't explicitly say, let's say, how many configurations they have taken in constructing okay. these distributions. Okay. So uh, could we please uh, share this reference? I mean, uh, yeah, yeah, I will send. I just found it this more the late last night because I got the thing from PRL. So I, uh, yeah, I will definitely share it. There are older experiments which also show a lot of this, um, but there's always been a huge sort of discussion as to how does this depend on how you define volume? So, like what what statistics you take? So experimentally, Gurugul, is it similar to like if I just have a draw a cell or something and just look at how many particles are there within that uh, volume and then multiply by I mean, that number will keep on fluctuating, right? Yeah. So similar to that, right? So if you take a hard sphere, I think here they did the Borona. Let me just find it. But yeah, roughly speak that. Sh but again, Sanjeev, the question is uh, people keep asking then, if I did that, would I see the same compactivity? Like, does it depend on how I sample the volume? I think is a big question. Oh, so, okay, so they don't do what I was thinking. They, I, I thought they took the Voronoi volume. They're not doing that. They're just saying I'm taking N grains. I think Sanjeev, what more or less you are saying. If I take 10 grains and I ask, what volume do these 10 grains occupy? And then I go to a different part of the system and then I take 10 grains again and say, what volume did these 10 grains occupy? And that's the histogram they're constructing. Right? That's a fluctuating quantity, just like N in a V would be a fluctuating quantity. If I fix N, the volume they occupy will be fluctuating. Uh, yes, ma'am. Just to uh, be uh, sure about what we're discussing about, is the mm -hmm. volume that they are measuring something like uh, taking ten of the closest neighbors and then measuring the distance from the uh, from the centermost particle to the outermost particle and drawing a sphere, or how exactly is this volume being measured? I thought they were doing the Voronoi. Now I'm now I'm confused. I'm not. Uh, I thought they were doing the Voronoi volumes, but that doesn't seem. Uh, Bulbul, to be but it says Voronoi volume, right? Just like uh, one of the places you showed, it said Voronoi. Yeah. Volume. So they defined the um, they defined the packing fraction by Voronoi volume. So that's what I assumed they were doing for the P of V also. Yeah, it must be because they say the yeah total Voronoi volume V of what? Yes. Okay. Yep. Right, yeah. Right. Okay. So I was right. So it's the total Voronoi volume of particles within this region. So they define a region which is the diameter times the number of grains, which is 15, let's say, over the packing fraction um, to the one third. So they take, uh, the, so they're fixing the radius of the region they're looking at and then measuring the Voronoi volume within there. So, Samar, does that answer your question? Uh, yes, I was just getting confused because uh, if it wasn't that, uh, then what would you have? Yeah, then it's, that, it's the same thing as before, right? So, yeah, so it's the Voronoi volume. Okay, so I wasn't completely wrong. Uh, I, I had a question. Yeah. So, yeah, so what role does the like uh, interacting forces have to play here aha uh -huh. very good question right so let's so so at this point the only role their role hasn't shown up at all right and that is one of the but in edwards's postulate these can only apply to systems even in Edwards's postulate, there was no concept, no notion of forces because he was thinking about hard spheres, right? Hard spheres can transmit infinitely large forces. Infinitely rigid particles, the only thing that matters um, are the positions of the grains. 
at, at zero temperature. There's no momentum. So force balance, torque balance doesn't enter this picture. It's only how many hard sphere configurations are can I find? Or you know, what are the hard sphere configurations that I can find? So tomorrow's lecture, I will try to get away from this and focus on the notion of force and torque balance. And there's one result in this paper, which is trying to get at that, which um, I have to, um, which is looking at how the average number of contacts depends on the pack, depend on the packing fraction. Now this average number of contacts, uh, the reason that that is an important quantity is because of force and torque balance. And so that notion has not been used here at all. And I want to explore that starting tomorrow, right? So in Edwards's volume ensemble, forces did not play a role. Okay, th thank you. Um, Bulbul, you made a comment about conservation. So when you say that, do you, uh, do you have Gibbs kind of ensembles in mind that you want to find the, the locally conserved quantities in right. terms of which you... Right, so if I want to justify the, Ed, the Edwards kinds of ensembles, right, then I, I can, in my mind, I come from either two, uh, um, two approaches. One is to say the kind of energy, you know, energy is conserved. So if I, uh, it's, so my total energy is fixed, I have equiprobability, all of that. The other is to come from a more information theoretic perspective or from a Gibbs entropy and say, okay, I'm going to maximize the probability distribution is the one that maximizes my Gibbs entropy subject to some constraints. And what are my constraints, right? So I can get the Edwards volume ensemble by saying I'm doing that with saying the average volume is a, I'm, I'm putting that as a constraint. So volume has to be conserved. Mm -hmm. Volume conservation bothers me. I don't know what it means, right? Of course, volume is conserved, but volume is always conserved that way, right? So there's it, nothing it, special. Is it conserved in your dynamics as you move from one tap state to jump to the next one under this dynamic? Is there conserved quantities? So, so the idea, so that, so, so it's saying that if I have a, a big system and I look at, at a part of it, right? That suppose, let's say I take a little bit of the grain out of that box, like I'm looking at one box, right? So I've changed the volume in here. Like maybe I have reduced the occupied volume. Then if volume is conserved, then I have to increase that occupied volume somewhere else, right? That's the notion. And that microscopically might be true at some coarse graining scale, but I don't know if it's true if I take a little bit of the grain out, right? Mm. I have a hard time thinking of this as in a continuum kind of way, right? If I just push a little bit of the grain out of this box, um, in what sense is volume conserved, right? It's, uh, it, if I say I, I now need to regain that every hard sphere is touching again, which I think is the Edwards idea, right? I cannot have gaps. Then everything has to reorganize. And then there's probably some conservation there, but I don't have um, the kind of local conservation that I'm looking for. And I can explain that more maybe tomorrow. Uh, bull, bull, but like it looks like something like I mean, if uh, some some of some guys are taking up a lot of volume, then it's reduced for the other guys, right? In that sense, it's conserved. I mean, like that, if you, I agree, right? But at what scale is it conserved? I think is what I'm thinking about, right? Uh, I mean, isn't it local? Because I can, I mean, I mean just imagine the some particles are like moving apart, then uh, just near. By it's getting more uh, kind of comp uh, why does it compact? have to be nearby i guess is my question 
can't it be just anywhere uh, i think that's my uh, that's okay. right globally yes right if i open up a hall here somewhere else there has to be right, densification yeah. but does it have to be close by like dynamically will be close by i mean if i think of uh, maybe dynamic... yeah right that, no no and, and something has to be because it looks like it works right right yeah but i've never been able to convince myself that it has to be local um okay. I, I, i'll give you what my uh, and i'll talk about this tomorrow right with the stress if i have force and torque balance i have the divergence of stress is zero that gives me a gauss's law that's a conservation law that i understand right it's a different kind of conservation law from energy but it's a conservation law um so you know if i if i uh change the stress through the boundary the the because just like gauss's law i cannot uh if if i move something then or if i change the stress somewhere within this region my stress has to it's a it's a it's a differential form of a conservation law and i don't have something similar for the uh, the volume but we don't not or normally write something similar for the energy either but there i have dynamics right maybe i'm that's where my my uh, that's where i have a disconnect like energy conservation is based on dynamics which i understand i can have other kinds of conservation laws like gauss's law which i understand the volume i can't put in either but this probably you know the dynamics in these circumstances probably does conserve volume because i we do recover this volume ensembles um that 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 uh, that people seem to find but it does the extensivity is still not very clear to me and that's where i think i'm like even here uh their the variance of their distribution keeps changing as they increase the their size which makes me think maybe it's not very local but okay um i will get away from the edwards volume ensemble starting tomorrow because i want to talk about other things um uh i i want to talk about a different way of thinking about granular statistical mechanics which is much more based on this gauss's law kind of conservation um and see where we get with that okay okay sorry i went above oh i have questions if i haven't answered questions yeah is there a thermodynamic kind of limit to that's the that's the that's the big question i think in the these um the voronoi volume i can explain tomorrow or you guys can discuss in the tutorial i'll put i'll put this paper um i'll i'll i'll, I'll upload this i can even put it in the chat someone actually did put it in the chat right did i just see that yeah yeah it just did yeah it. someone put it in the chat yeah yeah i'm sorry if i've sort of led you onto a red herring kind of um but but i think it's interesting right i think it's interesting that um these kinds of ensemble ideas do work uh to a certain extent for these systems that are not ergodic <clears throat> at all right uh, but under this tap, so that's my, so maybe the tapping does lead to some ergodicity. I'm it's not clear to me. Okay, but the other okay. three lectures, I'll get away from this and talk about uh, stresses and force and torque balance. Okay, so maybe uh, we stop here uh, today. Uh, so uh, thanks a should, lot, can... Bulbul. Uh, yeah, you have a question? Yeah, I actually I just. Uh, yeah, yeah yeah so like uh if 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 i want to verify this uh, gives like uh, distribution in 
uh, simulations then does it depend on like how i construct the boxes and measure the volume there so again people have done different um different methods and there's no consensus uh, some people will say it works some people will say it doesn't work it sort of depends a little bit on um so Whether there isn't much yeah. to believe this or not and the simulations right the question is how do you construct these states um uh if i if i uh, like uh, keep on adding uh, this uh, sand particles then i can then look at some volume around a particle like how does that change in in that way so that's not the question right the question basically that that the that the real the real question is if you take a box full of grains and can you establish that you have a very large box let's say i have even gone to the thermodynamic limit thousands of grains right can you in some way establish that the different parts of the system has the same compactivity it's like saying can i establish just like i have a thermometer i can go into a system and say oh if this the system has equilibrated a thermal system different parts of the system have the same temperature that's what we are trying to establish right that the different parts of the system have the same compactivity x and the way it's being tried to establish, the, the way people are trying to establish it is by looking at the distribution in different parts of the sample and saying, can I describe them using the same, the same compactivity? Because I don't have a thermometer to measure temperature. Uh, and that you do by fitting this uh, e to the power minus v by or something yeah like so you don't directly fit it because you don't know what the density of states is right so it's called this method of overlapping histograms that's that's just a detail but yes you're trying to establish two things you're trying to establish that the distributions have this very particular form um, that one something depends on the energy something depends on the temperature the partition function and there's only an exponential, the, the only way a combination of the extensive quantity and the intensive quantity enters is an exponential. And once you establish that, then you see, oh, then can I, can I collapse all of the, uh, the, 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 the histograms that I get from different parts of the, uh, can I, the, the histograms that I get from different realizations, can I collapse them all onto uh, one curve with the same compactivity? Right, just like in a normal thermal temperature, I would say, oh, if I measure the distribution of energy here, it should be e to the minus beta e. If I measure it here, it should also be e to the minus beta e because beta is the same in both places. So that's the question. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, I'll see you guys tomorrow. And sorry for a bit bit of a ramble here, but I'll I'll focus more tomorrow. <laughs>